Well, one of the most, if not the most, amazing and unexpected things, events in history was when the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Incarnation is probably one of the single least expected yet amazing things that happened. Uh, and maybe it's so unexpected because, as you remember, as Jesus was talking with the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The way that the Spirit of God became flesh is a remarkable thing. It's hard to imagine it. It's, it's hard to get our minds wrapped around how that might have happened. Uh, I mean, even if we uh, you know, think in terms of uh, uh, something like string theory in physics that says that all matter consists not of tiny particles, but of vibrating strings of energy. Wow, that's different than what we learned in, in grade school science and even high school and college science, right? For some of us. Uh, it's still hard to imagine how strings of energy could have somehow become solid matter. So really the incarnation or what I heard one man call the enfleshment of God is really an awesome mystery. And all we can do is bow in wonder before that event. Uh, but even if we sit and wonder about why God might have become human and just dispense with that and say, well, by faith we know it's true from the scriptures. We understand that it happened. But there is another mystery that, I don't know, maybe you've never wondered about. Maybe you think it's trivial. But to me, I, I am fascinated by that question of why after God raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus remained flesh. Why didn't he just revert to a spirit being? I mean, if he was the Word of God, if he was spirit in the beginning and became flesh, after his work on earth had been done, why didn't he just go back to being entirely spirit? I mean, after all, he... he seemed to have some of those characteristics. He could show up in a locked room, all of a sudden, boom, he's just standing there. He could apparently like walk through walls or, or do things like that. We honestly don't understand all that much about the nature of resurrection or the resurrection body, to be really honest. But there, is, uh, there are some people who really believe that Jesus was not raised bodily. They'll tell you they believe in the resurrection. But they think that Jesus was some sort of disembodied spirit. And even some early Christian writers would say things like, well, obviously when he walked on the beach with his disciples, he was the only one that didn't leave footprints. Well, no, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says, though, right? And this morning's scripture that Jackie read uh, was written by Luke, who we know was a physician. I mean, he certainly knew the difference between spirit and a substantial body, and he described that appearance of Jesus to his disciples in this morning's passage in a really striking way. I mean, after all, Jesus said, come here, I, you know, I, I have a, a body, I'm flesh and bone, not like a ghost. Uh, and then he says, oh, by the way, you guys got anything here to eat? 
and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it and it didn't just fall right through him. How amazing is that? That Jesus in his resurrected body was fully human, flesh and bone, as solid and substantial as you or me. And we might legitimately ask, why? I mean, this morning scripture tells us that Jesus was pretty adamant about wanting to demonstrate that to his disciples. He welcomed them to touch him and handle him and know that it was him. It wasn't just some body double that God created to take his place. It wasn't that somebody else was resurrected in his place. It wasn't that somebody else died on the cross and then, whoops, he just kind of came back on the scene after being in hiding. And No. He was dead. God raised him in the tomb and then he was as solid and substantial as you or me when he could walk around. But then every once in a while he just disappeared. I don't understand. I can't explain all of that stuff. But there's something about the resurrection body that God thinks is very important. Well, Jesus made it clear in talking to his disciples that uh, the scripture talked about that resurrection of the body in several places. He said, the scripture said that he uh, told them about passages in the prophets and in the Psalms about um, him being raised to life. And here is a, a, an artwork of Job and Job's wife, of course, giving him the helpful information to, to curse God and die. You know, that, that probably wasn't the best advice that anybody could have given. But Job said, and after my skin has been destroyed, in other words, after he's dead, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. He, he's talking about the resurrection of the body there. And then uh, King David in the Psalms, in the 16th Psalm, wrote, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. He was talking about the resurrection of Jesus' body there. So the scriptures had foretold that. Anybody who uh, knew the scriptures and trusted God wouldn't have had difficulty understanding and believing that, that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Uh, and over the 40 days that Jesus was with his disciples off and on after he uh, rose from the dead, the scriptures say that, that he taught them from the scriptures about the kingdom of God. Well, so what, so what is the role of, of the Spirit, or what about God's Spirit? Is God's Spirit all of a sudden out of the loop here? Well, no, uh, not necessarily, because we know that after the 40 days, Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives with his apostles, and he blessed them, and he ascended to heaven right before them, but before he went up, he told them two things. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, and I'm going to be with you. And then he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they received God's promise of the Holy Spirit. So there is the Spirit of God working with our physical beings with our bodies and it's really that partnership that somehow God 
had in mind from the beginning that uniting of body and spirit that is the most effective thing that we can hope for because we try to fulfill that great commission without the spirit of God it's doomed to failure uh, Jesus said it this way remember he said that He's the vine and we're the branches and God is like the husbandman or the gardener and he'll prune the branches that aren't bearing a lot of fruit so they'll, the ones that do bear fruit he'll prune so they're more fruitful and the ones that don't bear fruit will get just lopped off and burned but that's so the whole vine will be more productive or more fruitful. And again, it's us working with God's Spirit in us and acting, whether it's getting in a game of frogs or whatever, but it's working and making ourselves available to God so that God's purpose can be achieved. A great example of that is John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, who as a young man thought he was going to save everybody. In fact, he came as a missionary to America because he thought that the, uh, the Native Americans here were noble savages and that uh, he'd preach to them. They'd all accept Jesus and fall down and call him their savior and he'd feel wonderful about it. But he said that the problem was they were they were thieves and they were drunks and they beat their wives and, and nothing that he did seemed to make any difference. He said they're just like the English. So he went back to England uh, depressed, defeated, basically a broken man, thinking that he was a failure, that his faith was uh, in vain. And then he went unwillingly, rather unwillingly, to a meeting on Aldersgate Street. And there, while somebody was reading uh, the commentary on Romans, somehow, John Wesley's heart was touched. He said that he felt his heart strangely warmed, and that he knew at that point that even his sins were forgiven. And he was reconciled with God. And his life changed. He got all excited uh, about his faith and he started telling people about it. And he was a, a professor at Oxford in England at, at that time. And he would get invited out on Sundays to preach at surrounding churches. Well, He'd come into the church and preach about this thing of salvation uh, through faith in Christ alone. And, and that meant that, um, that everybody could be saved. That the common people were just as liable to be saved as the nobility. And that did not sit well with the pastors and a lot of the church people in England. And so Wesley got kicked out of one church after another and told he could never come back. It finally came to the point where he preached on his father's grave because he said that was the only place in England he could preach and not get kicked out of. And uh, Wesley had a friend named Charles Whitfield who was also a pastor, a Presbyterian, and Whitfield was having a lot of success and bringing a lot of people to the Lord by going out and preaching to the common people out in the fields and at the factories and at the mines. And so Wesley started going out and preaching at 4 and 5 in the morning before the factory workers would go to work, before the miners would go to work, and people started changing their lives and their hearts and coming to Jesus so he was having a lot of success there, but he still had to do the work of getting those new believers joined together in societies and 
classes and bands so they could support one another, so they could be accountable to one another, so they could encourage and pray for one another. And when that happened, revival swept across England and it extended all the way across the ocean into America. Because when God's Spirit works with our efforts and energy, when spirit and flesh come together, then revival can break out. And I'm not sure that that partnership would have been as clear if Jesus hadn't been raised bodily from the dead, if we would not be able to see in him that God's spirit, God's word, remained flesh. Well, in the Apostles' Creed, even though we don't recite that every Sunday, we say that we believe in the resurrection of the body. That's been the, the statement of faith of the church from the early days. And we believe that that's part of God's plan because people are whole beings, mind, spirit, and body. And something that people in the Methodist tradition have done also from the beginning is that we understand that ministering to people has to include caring for the mind, the spirit, and the body because the word remained flesh. Now, here we've got a picture of somebody that we all know and love. Grayson, who is this? Can you see who's on the screen? Who is that person? Who is that up there? Me? Yeah, that's you. Okay, we know Grayson, and we also, in case there are any of you here who don't know Grayson's, Grayson's situation, it was a few months ago she was finally diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. And we know that it's been a challenge for Grayson to be able to, to walk, and we've all been blessed, by the way, that, that Sam and Max take care of her and help her to get around and uh, Sarah said that she's got her own little scooter now is it power wheel truck to get around with and uh, long as she isn't terrorizing your house with that that's all a really good thing but uh, Sarah put together these pictures and the statement here what is muscular dystrophy? Uh, talks about all of the, the difficulties that people with muscular dystrophy run into. We see that it's related to uh, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, that we remember Stephen Hawking uh, had for years. And he, he was an extraordinary case because he lived way longer with ALS than probably any other ALS sufferer in history, and the way that muscular dystrophy and related diseases weaken muscle strength and limit people's mobility. So, uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, here's the, the logo, uh, works with people and with families of, of children with muscular dystrophy to try to help them. And, there's also a mission statement, it looks like here, of the Muscular Dystrophy Association to, as it says at the bottom of that top paragraph, to help people live longer and grow stronger. And they uh, sponsor research projects. They have adults and kids go to muscular dystrophy care centers each year. And then at the bottom there, more than 3,800 kids received the best week of the year at Muscular Dystrophy Summer Camp, free of charge. And so our church is going to learn all we can about muscular dystrophy. We're going to support the Smiths and support Grayson because not are we only going to minister to her mind and her spirit, but we're going to do what we can to minister to her body as well. And the reason that we do that is because 
when the Word of God became flesh, the Word of God remained flesh. And we understand that people are whole beings. And we minister, therefore, to people's mind and spirit and body. And because Jesus appeared in the flesh and was raised in the body, that's why we think that it matters a lot because every person, mind, spirit, and body, is important to our risen Lord and therefore important to us. So one of the things we're going to do during children's times over the next few weeks is that you remember those containers where the kids come out and shake everybody down for pocket change or changing your purse? Guess what? We're going to see those things again, and we're going to join in a collection. This pocket change, if you don't want to support it, you don't have to, but it's just pocket change, and we're going to contribute that to the Muscular Dystrophy Association in honor of Grayson, and uh, yes, Sarah. Okay, so we will in effect be sponsoring the Smiths in that muscular dystrophy walk on May the 5th. Okay, so you are invited to uh, help out. And if you want to contribute more than just pocket change, I bet they'll accept it. So, uh, all right, well, thank you for that. But I wanted us to be able to put a face on, on that collection so that we understand it's not just some cause for somebody somewhere else. This is about Gracie and about her being physically in our midst. So thanks be to God that God has called us to care for spirit, mind, and body. Amen and amen.